Um, I mentioned in prayer that this has been a sombering week. Um, started last Sunday, late afternoon, with the Garlic Festival in Gilroy and the shooting that occurred there. Um, there were some smaller shootings that happened during the week as well in Mississippi and Indiana. Four or five people killed in each of those. There was the local um, cliff collapse at the Encinitas Beach that, that killed three individuals. Um, and then yesterday, the El Paso shooting at Walmart that killed 20. And then early this morning, nine were killed in Dayton, Ohio, outside of a bar. That's a lot. That's a lot. Um, I think probably each of us in here knows that, yeah, bad things happen, but when they happen that close together, when they happen in common places like Walmart or grocery stores or movie theaters or the beach, um, it causes us to probably think about when we step outside our homes, maybe a little differently than before. I think it also may cause us to have questions of, God, where is your justice? How long will this go on? It's not fair that people are enduring such pain. Or God, if you're, if you're loving, if you're all-powerful, why don't you put a stop to these things? And I think these are logical and reasonable questions for us to have. And I don't think we could be in a more appropriate passage this morning. Um, if you've been with us, we've been going through the book of Malachi. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Um, it was written 400 years before Jesus was born. And Malachi is the final prophet before Jesus in which God, through his messenger, is warning, pleading with, and encouraging the people of Judah or Israel to turn back to God and if we had to put a summary title on the book of Malachi, we've been calling it God's response to fake religion. God's response to fake religion. Now, I've asked the question in here before, how many of us know that there's a lot of fake religion in the world? Now, all of us do. But specifically, what Malachi is addressing is the fake religion that was happening among God's people. If we put that into modern times, the fake religion that was happening inside of the church. The people who would come to church, raise their hands, sing hallelujah, praise Jesus, and then go about their life as if nothing has changed or transformed in them. Or the fake religion that was happening in Malachi's day that happens in our day of, well, hey, I give, I give an offering to the Lord. I give money. I serve in this ministry. I don't cuss. I don't drink. I don't smoke, pointing to their own acts of righteousness as the foundation of their salvation. And God, through Malachi, says, hey, that is fake religion, and I do not accept that kind of worship. Turn back to me. Repent. Recognize that we are depraved people in need of a Savior and walk in my ways. Walk in the statutes and the commands and the ordinances that I have given you. And Malachi chapter 1 verse 2 begins with this. I have loved you, says the Lord. I have loved you, says the Lord. It's the most important verse in all of Malachi because it's the foundation of how God speaks to His people. Now, as a father of four young kids, because I love my kids, what do I do with my kids? Wow, some of you are really quick. Nice work. I discipline my kids. And we've talked about through Malachi that because God is a loving Father who loves His children, He disciplines them. And there's a difference between unnecessary and unruly discipline like beatings um, or harsh and cruel words. Though that's not discipline. That's abusiveness. Discipline is to come alongside a child or someone else and to say, hey, what you're doing is hurtful to yourself and others and because I love you, I'm going to call you out in your sin, meet you where you are, and try and lead you to where you need to be. That's what a loving father does. And in Malachi, God calls out his own people. 
we can translate this to he's calling out us and saying, hey, you have taken what's sacred, my name, the worship of how you are to righteously worship me, and you've made it commonplace. No big deal. Who cares? Here I am again on Sunday. It's all good. I'll be back next Sunday, but my life just doesn't change. And God says, that's not okay. That's fake religion. Or he calls the people out in their lame offerings. They were not bringing their best to God. They were just giving him whatever they had left over. And God says to his people, I want your best. God also calls out the infidelity that's happening within the nation of Judah. The broken marriages in likeness to, hey, just as you've cheated on your wife... You have also cheated on me. You have left me for foreign gods or for the things of this world. And God calls the people back. And today will be the last charge that God brings against his people with a message of both conviction and a message of hope. And one of the reasons I wanted to address, whether it was the multiple shootings that have happened this week or the cliff collapse at the beach is when those things occur, especially if we're directly affected, it can get us to the point where we feel unloved. How many of you have ever felt unloved before? Probably most of us. We've had feelings of being unloved. Why do we hate to feel unloved? Well, one, it makes us insecure. It makes us feel like no one is protecting us. Or it makes us to feel inadequate like no one is providing for us. And probably the worst thing that comes from feeling unloved is the feeling of being alone. And in general, most of us are terrified of being alone. Whether that be from a relational standpoint, whether that be from a spiritual standpoint, or an emotional standpoint, we don't like the feeling of loneliness. And when tragedies like shootings or freak accidents impact us or cause us fear, anxiety, and worry, the enemy likes to come in and say, you're unloved. If there really was a God who loved you or loved this world, this garbage wouldn't go on. And the enemy will poke at us and shoot his fiery darts at us until we begin to believe those lies And we begin to question our Heavenly Father. If you need a Bible this morning, go ahead and raise your hand. We have ushers and greeters who have Bibles. It'll be a lot more enjoyable for you to read the Scripture um, while we're going through it. If you don't know where in the world Malachi is, um, there is a table of contents that you can open to, just like any book. And Malachi is spelled like Malachi, um, which, thank you, Pastor Dave, for the Italian reference. Um, It's the last book in the Old Testament, right before the Gospel of Matthew. So we encourage you to open that up. And we're going to be in chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. I believe that God's people at this point in history were probably feeling unloved. And here's why. They were currently under Persian rule. And Persia at this time was the first known superpower that the world had ever seen. It dominated three full continents. The kings were brutal and powerful. And yet King Cyrus was moved by God to allow the Jews who were in exile, which means taken from their homes, to begin to return to their capital in Judah called Jerusalem. And over some time, men like Ezra and Nehemiah, those that you've heard from the scriptures, had begun to help rebuild the structure of Jerusalem, which included its walls, the temple of God, and houses, and yet Jerusalem had not returned to kind of its glory days of King David and King Solomon. They were still oppressed by an empire who lorded over them, and I believe the people of Judah were feeling Unloved. Now, how many of you know there's a difference between how you feel and what's true sometimes? Anybody? We hold this tension of, I feel unloved, and yet I know I'm what? I know I'm loved. We could go through literally hundreds of scriptures in both the Old and the New Testament that remind us of how much we are loved by God and by our Savior. 
And yet the way we feel and the truth of God's word is often in tension. And so this morning we're going to take a look at what God calls out to his people for their wickedness. In verse 13 of Malachi chapter 3, he says this, Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, and this is the people speaking, what have we spoken against you? You have said, meaning God's people has said, it's useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his rules, regulations, or ordinances, and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed, for those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. God says, you've spoken harshly against me. What does that look like? What is he talking about? If we make this personal, which I think is appropriate, we take this week's events, or we take our past hurts, or maybe things you're going through presently, the difficult circumstances or trials that you face, And it's human nature for us to want answers, isn't it? We want to know the reason why. Why did this happen? And when we don't get the answers that we want, or the answers that make us feel better, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, who do we often point the finger at? We point the finger at God. Now what amazes me is this this spans across the church and then even all the way to atheists of being angry at God. In which we go, wait a minute. If you are loving, if you are all-powerful, if you are sovereign, if you have control over all things, how could you let this happen? This is your fault. This is your fault. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but myself included. Have you ever thought those thoughts before? Because I know I have. When I'm in pain, when I get wrongfully accused of something, when I'm kicked out of my own church, I had questions too. But God says, You have spoken harsh against me. Because here's the reality of what we need to address. If we are willing to ask the question, what kind of God would allow that to happen? I have to go back to the cross and go, what kind of God allows that to happen? What kind of God takes his own son, who's perfect and sinless, and allows him to be crucified and kills him with his wrath so that I don't have to endure it? What kind of God does that? That's the kind of God who is loving and sacrificial and who allows us to be redeemed and forgiven despite our sin at His cost. Now it doesn't address the pain. It doesn't address making people feel better on this end when tragedies happen. But my encouragement for you to think about is when the worst of the worst occurs come back to the cross and go, what kind of God allows this to happen? It's this kind of God who loves even sinners. It's this kind of God who loves even sinners. You have spoken harsh against me, says the Lord, and yet the people say, what have we said? What have we said? I have uh, four little kids, and um, my wife and I, will be around the corner, wherever that is, and sometimes we will hear harsh words come from one child to another child, and all I have to do is say, Uriah, what did you say? And his response is, oh, Dad, I am so sorry. I have sinned against you and God. Please forgive me. (laughs) No, that's not what happens. The response is, what? What? I didn't say anything. What? What? This is the response of God's people. Now, the truth is, does my child know that they've said something wrong? Kind of. 
I think in large part, yes, but also there is this pride, there is this anger and frustration because for whatever reason, at that moment, they're feeling unloved or uncared for or that they've been violated by their brother or sister in some way, that there is this resistance of what? He deserves it. She deserves it. I didn't say anything bad. And so we're going to unpack that a little bit this morning. What is it that the people are saying in which God says, hey, you have spoken harshly to me in an unjust and unrighteous way? Look at what God says the people say to him. It is useless to serve God. Useless. What does this word useless even mean? This word useless means that whatever it is that the person is investing in or whatever it is that the person has is worthless to them. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. And for the people of Judah, they were saying, God, following you is literally useless. What have you done for me lately? What have you done for me lately? What do I get out of this? My marriage isn't where it wants to be. My finances aren't where I want them to be. Look at my house. Look at my apartment. Look at this temple. Look at this church that I go to. What have I gotten out of this? Following you is worthless and useless. You think that's harsh to say to God? I think it is too. Even though it's coming from a place of pain and frustration, God says, hey, this isn't okay the way that you're speaking to me. You've spoken harshly against me. The people then say, what profit... Is it that we have kept your ordinance or just simply means your commands? What profit, what have we gained out of this? If we enter into any relationship, whether it's with God or with a spouse or with a friend, and we set the marker by saying, hey, I'm only going to be in this relationship if I get what I want. How's that going to go? Hopefully more of you have experience with that doesn't go well, right? It doesn't go well. If we come into relationship saying, what am I going to get out of this? We will find ourselves very disappointed. Our expectations unmet. And yet the type of relationship that God entered into with us through his son, Jesus Christ, was not one of, what am I going to get? Because what does God need from us? Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing that we could possibly give him to increase what he already has. There is nothing that he needs from human beings or any of his created work. And yet he entered into a relationship with us in which he gave his life for us because he loved us even while we were still sinners. Not because of what he could get, but because of what he could give. And the people of Judah have forgotten this relationship. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinances? Now, if you've been with us through the book of Malachi, has God's people obeyed his commands? No way. They've broken all of them. Not just some of them. They've literally broken all of his commands. And yet, in their minds, they look at their own self-righteousness and use it as their leg to stand on to say, hey, I've been putting money in the plate. I've been coming to church three out of the four weeks. I've been whatever it is. And that's their claim to being owed a good life as they determine what a good life is. God says, hey, this is fake religion. This is false worship. This is not how you are to come to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm not going to accept this or allow this to continue because I love you. And the way you're worshiping me leads to eternal death. I have come to bring you new life. And we're going to see at the end of Malachi 4 how Malachi is pointing to Christ Jesus. The people continue to complain. We have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts. This idea of mourning that's M-O-U-R-N, of sadness, of sorrow. Yes, they had been in exile and slavery. How did they end up in exile and slavery? Because they were disobedient and rebellious people. They would not walk in the ways of the Lord, and he allowed other nations to attack them. 
and to carry them off into exile until they would return to a right way of worship. And we may say, God, that's, that's pretty harsh. Well, is it harsh when your kid wants to try heroin and you lock them inside the house so they can't get to it? Is that harsh? Depends on your perspective. What does heroin lead to? It leads to death. Or at least a life of slavery and addiction that will need a miracle of God to get out of it. As a parent, you would do whatever you can to protect your child, and God does the same with his people to bring them back into right worship. The result of the people blaming God. What do we get from this? What do we profit? The people now say, so we call the proud blessed. For those who do wicked are the ones who profit or are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. We might as well just live the way the rest of the world lives because there's really no benefit to following Jesus. That's their cry. That's their heart. If you're taking notes this morning, write this down. This is a very direct, and it's meant to be direct, note. Harsh words come from a corrupt heart. Harsh words come from a corrupt heart. When we speak at God as anything less than creator of the universe and savior of our souls, we speak harshly against him, which comes from our own corruption. When we speak harshly against our spouse, I can't believe you did that again. What an idiot. Where does that come from? comes from a corrupt heart. When we speak harshly against our children or our co-workers or our neighbors, where does that come from? It comes from a corrupt heart. Now this morning's purpose of this message is not to beat you up, although as I was studying for this message, that's what I was feeling was happening. Here's what we need to realize. In our total depravity as human beings, we are corrupt to the core. When everything is going the way that I want it to go in my life, how often do I find myself on my knees saying, Jesus, thank you. You get all the glory and all the honor and all the praise for everything good that's happening. How often does that happen in your life? But then when things go circumstantially bad or wrong, are we coming before God with the same mentality of God, thank you? As Job would say, We need to accept both the bad and the good from God for he is trustworthy. And yet, oftentimes our automatic response is to point the finger at God and go, you did this. This is your fault. And then the enemy comes in and sows all the seeds and lies of being unloved, which is not true. So what could the people of Judah do differently? What can we do differently to combat the lies that we're unloved or that this is God's fault? We can go back to his word and his story. I know it sounds like a very pastoral thing to say, and it certainly is, but brothers and sisters, the beloved of God, please read the scriptures. Please read your Bibles. Please be reminded and grounded in the truth in a world that is selling lies in every area you can imagine. When you're feeling down, depressed, anxious, full of worry, angry, would you please run to the scriptures instead of whatever coping mechanism it is that is ingrained? Here's why. In the difficult circumstances that Judah found themselves in, they could have gone back to the creation of the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when he saw all that he had made, God said that it was what? It was good. It was good. And why was it good? Because he made it. He made it. And yes, 
Sin enters into the world and death follows, but does that change that God sees us as his beloved creation? Does that change? No, and we know that it doesn't change because when we go further in the story and we get to the person of Jesus Christ, God sent his only son to die for us so that we could be saved because he loves us. Now, for the people of Judah, they didn't have the opportunity to look back at Jesus, but they had a host of opportunities to look back at God's story and where he loved them. When he brought them up out of Egypt and delivered them from the oppressive hand of the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, when he brought them through the Red Sea, when he brought them into the Promised Land, when David defeated Goliath and the Philistines, when God wiped out armies much more powerful than Israel had, over and over and over again, if we go back to the Word, we can see that God loves us, that He is our provider and our protector, that He is our redeemer and our rescuer. So that when the lie comes of, does God really love justice? I mean, really, can a God allow 20 people just shopping at Walmart to be killed? What are we going to do to combat that? We go to God's word, Psalm 9, 16 through 18. The Lord is known for his justice. The wicked are trapped by their own deeds. The wicked will go down to the grave. This is the fate of all the nations who ignore God. But the needy will not be ignored forever. The hopes of the poor will not always be crushed. Psalm 37, 28. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. How much are they preserved? But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. Or Nehemiah 9, or Psalm 86, or the entire book of Jonah, God is abounding in love and slow to anger. If we do not have God's word in our arsenal, when the enemy sows lies in our life, we find ourselves being anxious and angry and overly discouraged. It is the truth of God's word that grounds us when the world seems to be on fire. And sometimes it just is. Whether that's in our own personal lives, or whether that's in our community, or whether that's in our nation as a whole. But here's the beauty and the power of God's word. If we are to hang on to these scriptures of God's justice and that the wicked will be punished, There is a temptation for us to go, ooh, someday those guys are going to get it. How many of you naturally respond that way if you get hurt? Yeah, I do. I've been wrong significantly before in my life. And my last thought initially is, oh, Lord Jesus, please help that person. (laughs) It's usually, ooh, vengeance isn't mine, but God's coming for you. Judgment day is around the corner. But here's the truth of God's word. It says that the wicked will be punished. Who's wicked? Thank you. That's all of us. Instead of having a heart of vengeance, it should drive us to a heart of compassion of, man, I feel for those families of the people who have died this week. And I feel for the shooters who apparently didn't think they had any way but this way. Because I'm sure they felt unloved. Does not give them permissiveness to do what they did. What they did is an act of evil. But this is the power of God's word versus all the fake religion that's out there is those people need Jesus as much as we do in here. And when we only see following Christ from a perspective of how it profits us, we have sorely missed the truth of God's salvation. If you're taking notes this morning, write this down. The wicked follow, in quotation marks, Jesus for what they can profit. They ask, what do I get out of this? I know a lot of people who walk into a church or who call the church during the week going, hey, if I follow Jesus, does that solve X problem and Y problem and Z problem? Hey, if I follow Jesus, 
Does all this stuff from my past just go away? Do I not have to be in pain anymore? And the answer is no. Now, can God solve anything? Yes, he absolutely can. But if we are here to enter into a relationship to get what we want and to get things fixed in our life, from an earthly perspective, we will be disappointed. Because oftentimes walking with Christ means a life of faith is more difficult than a life without faith. Those who follow Jesus from a wicked perspective base their salvation on their own works of righteousness. Because I've done all these things, because I read my Bible every day, because I go to church and have been for 45 years, I'm in. It's no different than what the Jews said of simply being the descendants of Abraham. They were in. They didn't have to live life any differently because they were chosen. That's not true. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way. And then lastly, the result of this kind of heart or attitude is that we see the ways of the world as the right way. I'm just going to get mine. Doesn't matter who I step on. Doesn't matter who I manipulate, take advantage of. As long as I get mine, those are the people who really get ahead in life. From an earthly perspective, there may be truth in that. But from an eternal perspective, it only leads to death. Jesus is having some conversation with his disciple Peter. And he tells Peter and his other disciples, hey, the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of the leading priests. And he must suffer and die. And Peter, being the good friend he is, says, what? No way! I'm not going to allow it! You're my buddy, Jesus! You're the Messiah! You're the promised one! Nothing bad can happen to you! That's not going to happen! How many of you would like a friend like Peter? Man, he's got your back until he doesn't have your back. This is Jesus' response besides calling him Satan and telling him to get behind him. He says this, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? God's response to verses 13 through 15 is seen in Jesus here of, hey, you've become so deceived that you think that the ways of the world are the right ways. I tell you, you have to give up your own way. You have to lose your life to gain it. And that only comes through me, through Christ. Now, how many of you would like some good news this morning? We started off the first half of that sermon. It was kind of another, like all of Malachi, a kick in the pants, huh? So who's ready for some good news? Okay. Oh, good. Clapping even. That's wonderful. So in Malachi's day, the majority of the people who heard Malachi teach and give this message did not turn from their wicked ways. They continued worshiping God in fake ways. And yet, even though the majority did not turn, Malachi tells us in verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. That just refers to the right worship of God. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On the day that I make them my jewels or my special treasure, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him, then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. This is wonderful news. That there were some who listened. There were some who obeyed. There were some who were convicted by God's Spirit and turned their lives to worship God in a right way. And here's the beauty of what those people experienced. Here is the truth that combats the lies of the enemy. 
The righteous follow Jesus in reverent fear and worship. The righteous follow Jesus in reverent fear and worship. What does reverent fear mean? It's not the type of fear um, that you have of like someone's going to come and get you. It's the type of fear of you are so in awe and in love and inspired by someone that you have a complete fear of disappointing them or doing wrong or somehow bringing shame to their name. The type of fear we are to have of God who loves us. And to meditate on his name means to be in the word of God, to spend time in prayer, to look at all aspects of your life in the lens of the good news of Jesus Christ. Here is what God says for those who fear him and meditate on his name experience. It says, and the Lord listened and heard them. God listens and hears our prayers. God listens and hears our prayers. How many of you, when you pray, would like to be heard when you pray? Yeah, that's all of us, I think. If we're praying, the whole purpose is to be heard by who? By God. But here is the truth according to God's word. There are things that can hinder our prayers. When we are choosing not to walk in righteous ways, when we are unrepentant, in rebellion, and brash against God and his commands, and then we have the audacity to go, hey God, where are you in my life? Why aren't you showing up the way I want to? You think he receives those prayers? No way. That's fake religion. That's fake worship. That's simply being in a relationship to get what you can get. But to those who fear God and meditate on his name, God listens and hears our prayers. Verse 16, or excuse me, 17 also says, They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels or my special treasure, and I will spare them as a father spares a son who serves him. We become God's special treasure and are considered his children. We become God's special treasure and considered his children. Now, let's go back all the way to the beginning when I asked that question, how many of you have ever felt unloved? Can you raise your hands, please? When you are feeling unloved, do you need to know that you are God's special treasure and his child? Yes, you do. We need to be reminded of that and reminded of that when we are in the word. Lastly, and to me, this is the most important part of this section of scripture in verse 18. It says, then you shall again discern because there was a lack of discernment, a lack of understanding between the righteous and the wicked. Remember the people in verse 15 said, hey, the wicked are the ones who are right and raised up. The righteous are the losers. They had lost discernment and insight. And God says, when you walk in my ways, you will again be able to discern who is righteous and who is wicked. And here's why that's important. We are circumstantially based people, which means when you have a bad day at work, how's your mood when you get home? Usually bad. Some of us have learned to take that drive and just decompress and then leave work where it belongs. But for most of us, if we've had a bad day at work, we bring it home. It's because we're circumstantially based people. When we look at our circumstances, it often impacts how we see the rest of our life. Specifically, our identity. When we're going through trials or hardships or we feel like we're being treated unfairly or we feel like we're unloved based on our circumstances, we often come to the conclusion that we are unloved. And that I'm not sure if I'm even secure in Christ because how could God let this happen? And yet when we walk in the ways of the Lord, when we're in his word, when we worship him in right ways with fear and reverence that he deserves, we are reminded of our identity that transcends our circumstances. When we look at the Apostle Paul, how many of you know who the Apostle Paul was? Did he have a life of good circumstances or bad circumstances after he came to Christ? Bad! Shipwrecks, snake bites, being stoned to death with rocks, and then he would go back into the city and minister, and then they'd try to beat him again, beaten with rods, put in jail, and eventually beheaded in Rome. Who's in? 
circumstantially a rough life. His identity, always grounded in Christ Jesus. Unwavering. That doesn't mean he didn't experience pain. That doesn't mean he didn't have feelings of being unloved. What it means is he had his feet firmly planted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which defined his identity, which allowed his circumstances to be glorifying to God instead of destroying who he was. Something we should deeply think about. Malachi continues with the last six verses. We'll get through these relatively quickly. Malachi says this, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will become stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. We will cover that, don't worry. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. What is God speaking of? He is speaking of judgment day. Now, if I were to say it in this tone, I don't want to scare anyone. Are you ready? If I say, judgment day! Some of you may have grown up in churches like that. We got yelled at about judgment day. Um... Our society has made Judgment Day this massive doom and gloom thing. Is it? Now you're wondering, because I asked it in that tone of voice. It's like leading, right? Here's the truth about Judgment Day. The day is coming, says the Lord. There's no putting a stop to it. We don't know when that is. We're closer today than we were yesterday, but we don't know the timing of when Judgment Day is. But on Judgment Day, two things will happen. God will separate the wicked from the righteous. And the wicked and the righteous are not determined by their works that they have done on their own, but by the work of Christ Jesus and those who have put their faith in Christ. And the wicked will be separated into outer darkness away from God's goodness where they will suffer for eternity in which they will burn like a fire until there is no root or branch but it will continue burning. Does that sound pleasant? No. And again, we should be driven to a heart of compassion. Do we want to see anyone perish in eternal suffering? We shouldn't. Neither did God, which is why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And yet also we know on Judgment Day that it says that the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings so that those who have followed Christ for eternity will be cared for like stall-fed calves. Now we need some translation here, right? If we go back into ancient society, it was an agrarian society, which means they grew a lot of crops, They had a lot of livestock, and there was a difference between a cow that was just kind of put out to pasture to fend for itself and a stall-fed calf. A stall-fed calf was cared for multiple times a day. It was always fed. It was protected from the elements. It was nurtured. It was provided for, and God says, this is what I will do for the righteous in eternity. Some of you may not like the idea of being a fat cow in heaven. No, thank you. It's not what it's saying, but here's what it is saying. There are no skinny cows in heaven. There is no one that's not provided for, that's not cared for, that's not loved, that's not protected. For eternity, God's people will experience all that God has to offer, an unhindered relationship with him and his son and with one another as the saints. So when we think of judgment day, Do we not want to see wickedness, sin, the grave, and Satan put away forever? Of course we do. Does it cause us pain to know that there will be people who do not choose Christ and experience eternal suffering? It should. And yet the beauty of God's promise is that this is available for everyone. Jesus is not exclusive. People are exclusive against Jesus. Let's just be clear about that. Christ does not reject 
people. People reject him. If you're taking notes this morning, write this down. Do you live in anticipation of Judgment Day? Do you live in anticipation of Judgment Day? Here's why this is a a good question to think about. It's probably unrealistic to think that this morning you woke up going, Ha ha! Today could be Judgment Day! And it's probably not the best greeting when you see someone on the street to go, Hey, today could be Judgment Day! Be like, oh yeah, you're from the Mission Church, huh? Great. But here's why it's worth considering. Again, if we make this personal, do you think the 20 people who didn't survive Walmart yesterday thought about when they went shopping that it was the last day that they would be breathing? Probably not. But here's the truth. Is that if we are not living in anticipation for judgment day, which in its fulfillment is the return of Jesus Christ, then what are we thinking about? Because there's nothing that should take our eyes and mind off of the blessing and promise that God will return himself through his son. If we live in anticipation of judgment day, it creates a sense of urgency, not just in our own lives, but how God might use us to minister to others. And I'm not talking about desperate discipleship here where you run up to someone and you grab them by the collar and say you have to repent right now it's not on your shoulders some of you need to hear that today people coming to Christ is not a burden you have to carry walking in obedience and using the opportunities that God has called you to is what you are to walk in obedience with Living in anticipation of Judgment Day also reminds us that hell is a real, terrible, and eternal place. We live in a society where an academic church world here in the West, academic scholars have tried to find a way to dismiss hell even from the teachings of Jesus because it just offends and makes people uncomfortable. And yet the gospel itself is offensive. If Christ is the only way, if we must submit our lives and worship him as king, that message alone is offensive. But the beauty of living in anticipation of judgment day is that heaven is more than we can imagine. Revelation chapter 21 says that God will wipe away every tear. There will be no more pain or suffering or death And that God will dwell with his people and his people with God. And that he is making all things new. Just like we sang this morning. That God is making all things new. So Malachi finishes with this. He says, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and the judgments. Now, when it says, remember the law of Moses, what is the law of Moses? It's the Ten Commandments, right? It's the way the nation of Israel, God's people, were to live by. And we're talking in Old Testament times. But here's the beauty of what Malachi is doing. Is he pointing people to, hey, make sure you remember all the rules and follow them very carefully. Is that exactly what he's saying? No, it's not. And here's why we know that. Because who is the fulfillment of the law? It's Jesus. Now you may say, hey, pastor, that's a, that's a big jump. I mean, Malachi is talking about the law of Moses here. How do you get Jesus out of this? Look at verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Who is Malachi prophesying about? This is John the Baptist. This is confirmed in Luke chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, when the angel of the Lord comes to the priest Zacharias and says, in his old age, you are going to have a son, and his name will be John, and he will be the forerunner to Christ, and the spirit of Elijah will be upon him, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the children's hearts back to their fathers. Malachi is pointing the people to Jesus, Not to rules and regulations, to the fulfillment of the rules and regulations that is Jesus. 
And in verse 6, Malachi finishes with, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. The exact same words used in Luke chapter 1 when the angel speaks to Zacharias. Here's what I want you to take away. The Old Testament ends with pointing to Jesus. The New Testament begins with the coming of Jesus, and the New Testament ends with the return of King Jesus. The entire scripture is pointing to Christ. When we are suffering in times of trial and hardship and pain, I don't have answers for the specifics. I can't tell you why something happened, when it happened, and why it happened. But I do know that the entirety of Scripture continues to point us to the answer who is Christ Jesus. Because He understands, He knows what it's like. He feels the pain you feel. He understands the depths of your sorrow. And so when we think about the coming judgment day, write this in your notes. Remember and rejoice at the coming of Christ. Remember and rejoice at the coming of Christ. This is where we are constantly to return. This is the foundation, the cornerstone of what we are called to remember in those times of darkness.